Hello, and welcome to the confused, spiky peaks of Blades Edge Mountains. Now, because the writers chose to explain that Blades Edge formed from Frostfire Ridge and Gorgrond smashing together, and that's why neither really resembles the resulting zone, I'm going to take them at their word and write it actually looking like that happened. So bear with me. The western half of Blades Edge will resemble a Frostfire Ridge with higher altitude, alpine terrain, and ragged snowy peaks. You'd see thick evergreen forests, black stone spires, and snowmelt forming rivers that flow towards the east. But Morgan, Frostfire Ridge didn't have thick evergreen forests, I hear you say. Correct, but everyone in that region uses an awful lot of wood for the amount of empty open space to be found, so shush. The eastern half of Blades Edge will resemble Gorgrond, with drier, warmer scrubland, thick vegetation surrounding lakes and streams, and salt basins. Between these, we'd have Dagamore Canyon, which receives the majority of the west's snowmelt, turning it from the dry, dead expanse in Canon to a temperate wetland, which fits the riverbed patterns you can see on the canyon floor. All of which would of course have the eponymous blades jutting out everywhere, and we'd learn that these were created due to the violence of the planet shattering, expelling mass amounts of basaltic rock. Storms of wild magic then carved and shaped this molten material into the spires we see today, earning the hybrid region's new name of Blades Edge Mountains. There were a lot of things to string together for this one, but I hope you enjoy what I've done here. Let's get started. We begin our journey by meeting up with Verisa and Laurelin in the ruins of Sylvanar. Similar to the Scenarian Expedition settlements, it always kind of struck me as odd that we were able to build whole towns like this in... How long have we even been here at this point? At least in Warlords of Draenor it made a bit of sense because we had to spend significant time building resources and waiting for things, so it kind of felt like at least some time had passed? The other thing that stood out to me about Sylvanar is that it's a Night Elven Alliance settlement that is two letters away from being named after Sylvanas. So in this version of events, Sylvanar would have run down High Elven architecture, making it an overrun stronghold of the Sons of Lothar from decades past. Verisa and Laurelin are chasing signs of Valeria's passage and ask our help in searching the area for any useful information and putting to rest the troubled spirits of slain High Elves and humans who perished here. We gain deeper insight into the Forsaken approach to death here, as while Verisa straightforwardly wants us to just attack the spirits to put them out of their misery, Laurelin hands us a block of incense in a small censer and has us ease the spirits to talk to them. They have suffered enough. Heaping another trauma upon them will gain us nothing. But the Forsaken have learned how to treat the dead with more respect. We no longer need to simply beat a tortured soul back into the ground. Not when we can help them come to terms with what has happened to them, and lay them to their final rest. At that, we set out with her while Verisa searches for any physical information in the form of journals, letters, or reports. Waving the incense causes the spirits to stop their frantic rushing around, allowing us to talk to them. Many of the ghosts are still trapped in the trauma of a violent death, and Laurelin approaches them with unwavering patience and a telling kindness, encouraging them to let go of their burdens and pass on. A few are rendered lucid enough to hold a conversation before they leave, and piece by piece we learn what happened to the settlement. In the wake of Outland's formation, Sylvanar was attacked by starving ogres, too many to hold off. Most of their non-combatants escaped, the tradesfolk, farmers and the like who ended up in Shatrath, but the rest of them did not. The ogres did not starve that night. When questioned about Ilaria, the ghosts have no answers. All they can say is that neither Ilaria nor Turalyon were present during the attack and haven't passed through since. Once all the spirits are laid to rest, we return the censor to Laurelin and regroup with Verisa at a large tower in the center of Sylvanar. She found reports detailing battles, scouting missions, and daily logs about conditions here, but not only do they have nothing to go on regarding her sister, they seem confused. The area they're describing is nothing like this. Sylvanar is surrounded by alpine terrain, snow, and evergreens, not a dry, hot ridge overlooking a jungle. That was a long time ago. 
A deep voice interjects from outside, and stepping into the doorway, we see Rexar. Varisa is immediately on edge, demanding to know who he is, but Laurelin addresses him with an orcish welcome, respecting his prowess as a hunter. Rexar returns the greeting in shaky elven out of similar respect, and directs his introduction to Varisa. My name is Rexar. I am Maknathal, and a champion of the Horde. I watched you arrive and waited to see your temperament. Your care for the dead is admirable. He asks why we've come here, and Laurelin explains that we're searching for signs of Valeria Windrunner. Verisa seems agitated by this exchange, but says nothing. Rexar hums thoughtfully, understanding the desire to reunite with family. He says that he doesn't have any information for us, he wasn't trapped on this side of the dark portal when it was shut. However, the Mokdathal might know something. At Laurelin's prompting, he matter-of-factly states that decades ago he made the choice to travel through the dark portal. Gul'dan's magic had wreaked havoc on their world. The land was dying, and very few regions remained livable. What little space the Mognathal kept for themselves after breaking free of the ogre's enslavement was not sustainable. They desperately needed food and water, and he believed he could find them a better life through the Old Horde. But Gul'dan was a liar, always and to the end, and Rexar severed himself from his people for nothing. The Dark Portal reopening has allowed him the opportunity to make things right, when he thought he would never see his home again. Even if my people do not have anything for you, if you aid me, I will do the same for you. We agree to this, and Rexar tells us where to meet him, an old orcish settlement called Thunderholes to the east, across the Dagamore Canyon. After he leaves, Verisa expresses discomfort working with him, given Rexar is a recognized champion of the Horde and came to Azeroth invading and pillaging with the Old One. He could have very well been a part of the forces that burned Quel'Thalas with enslaved dragons during the Second War. Laurelin pointedly asks her if she cares more about denying the man a chance to reconnect with his lost kin than finding Alaria. Verisa refutes that, commenting that his family is none of her business, but that doesn't mean she has to like working with him. Laurelin mutters that we all do what we believe is in the best interest of our people, even if it comes at the expense of others, reflecting the pragmatism the Forsaken have had to adopt in order to survive a world that doesn't want them. We meet up at Thunderhold, where the Moknathal have taken over this former settlement of the now extinct Thunderlord clan. Inside its battered walls, we find Rexar talking to three people who appear to be spearheading the fight against the ogres. These characters introduce themselves as Laka, a Blackford Saberon, and Moral and Akula, Marknathal siblings. Moral is a cunning hunter, and she's the older of the two, with a Rylak companion called Nightwing. Aquila is a shaman and Moral's baby brother, a gentle soul concerned with healing and rejuvenation, but more than willing to defend his people through fighting. Laka is a warrior empowered by his tribe's eldest witch doctor with the spirit of his fallen mate, Sidor. When prompted by the adventurer, Laka explains that Sidor was killed fighting the ogres, and that he is a brave, passionate sort who lifts spirits as easily as breathing. Being soulbound this way allows them to stay together to protect their pride, and when asked, Laka notes that when he dies, their souls will merge and join with Dasboru, the Saberon personification of Outland's son. At least one of the non-noun names Saberon have is Sasha, which made me latch onto the idea of them as some mix of Slavic cultures, and so the name for their sun god is taken from a Slavic sun god called Dazbog. Sidor is referred to in present tense, and it's shown, with Larka's consent, that Sidor can speak through him, showing he's amused by the adventurer's curiosity and that this was very much a willing choice by him, stating, I would make the same choice a thousand times over if it means I can keep him safe. At least until it is time for us to join the sun together. But hopefully that is a ways off. For now, I am quite happy to remain. This partial control would be indicated by a smoking blue glow that takes over Laka's eyes whenever Sidor speaks, and would trigger during a couple of idle animations, one where Sidor seems to fuss over Larka and dust him off, and another where he has Larka stretch because standing still for too long is bad for you. The Ogres are a massive problem that both the Mognathal and the Saberon are trying to deal with, having formed a mutual alliance to face the threat. 
the trio explain to us that multiple ogre clans are under the dominion of Gruul the Dragon Killer, one of the few remaining Gron left after most of them died during the rise of the Old Horde and the subsequent shattering of the world. The clan most favoured by Gruul is the Bladespire, a dragon hunting obsessed clan of ogres who actively hunt the Netherwing of Blades Edge, and they comprise the more intelligent and magic savvy of his forces. Ogre Lord and High Dictator Mulgarius is from this clan, and has absolute authority over all the ogres, acting as Gruul's second. The Warmall clan is led by Caius the Pillager, and his second in command, Maurizio, and they serve as the bulk of Gruul's martial forces. They also serve as slave drivers, catching, chaining, and supervising them. The Bloodmall are the smallest and weakest of the three clans, and were forced to submit to Gruul's authority. They are used as labour, only barely above the level of slaves, and their governor Decius works only to elevate himself. Before then, the Blood Mole kept to themselves in the Alpine lowlands, living an otherwise peaceful agrarian existence that they would fiercely defend. That ferocity simply wasn't enough when the Gron became involved. Before it got to this point, Leorox and the rest of the Mognathal allowed the ogres their own space to rebuild and thrive. He wanted to give them one chance to change and choose better, as the Blood Mole did, but that grace has been spurned, so the Oryx ordered targeted strikes, which is where Morale, Aquila, and Larka come in. Rexar expresses some surprise at this, as he expected the Oryx to meekly move their people elsewhere rather than fight. Aquila remarks that peace should always be the first choice, but if someone lifts their hand to strike, then the time for peace is over. They must act or perish. We work with the trio to strike back at the ogres, weakening their hold on nearby territories such as the Dagamor Canyon, from which they launch attacks. Severing supply lines, blocking routes the ogres use, and stealing food from their stores, at least half of which Morale notes was raided from the Mocknathal and Snowclaw Pride in the first place. They already used our people once for tasks they deem below them. Farming, hunting, shock troops. We won't suffer it again. We also work to free slaves from the Drainethist mines in the southern tip of the Dagamor Canyon. Seeing how they're treated, but also seeing drudges of the Blood Mole actively pretend they don't see us, because they hate their Loden life too, but they're too scared to act out, yet. It's only deep within the mines when a War Mole Taskmaster catches us unawares that a Blood Mole Ogre Worker smashes him in the back of the head with a pickaxe. Larka demands to know who he is, and the ogre introduces himself as Gallo. He tells us we don't have much time to get out before someone notices us again, but points us north to a gladiatorial arena called the Circle of Blood. The High Dictator forces us to fight and kill our friends, family, the old, or has the Wall Mall beat us bloody for nothing? It makes him laugh to feed our bodies to gruel. This is not life. We don't want this. He gives us the name Gerontius the Wizened, an ogre mage of the Blood Mole who serves in the retinue of their traitorous leader, Decius. Seek him at the Circle of Blood. Help him burn it down. We can be more than this. Gallo flees deeper into the mines, leaving us to escape with the rescued slaves and return to Thunderhold. Laurelan expresses confusion over how articulate and calculated Gallo was when he clearly wasn't a mage or even a two-headed ogre. In fact, all the ogres they've fought or observed thus far have been nothing like those on Azeroth. You may have noticed that I altered various names here as well, and that's in part because the old Gorian Empire seemed very much inspired by the Roman Empire. Thus, I gave the ogres more Romanesque names, along with some Italian names sprinkled in as their culture shifts over time. So, High King Molgar becomes High Dictator Molgarius. The leader of the War Mole, Chowo, becomes Caius and his second-in-command, Mogo, becomes Maurizio. Grok, the one who points you towards helping the Blood Mole rebel from all the way in Shatrath, becomes Gallo, and Mogdor the Wizened becomes Gerontius, because it means old and I'm a simple creature. Why the stark difference between Outland and Azeroth? Well, Rexar grimly explains that Gul'dan was concerned about the ogres growing ambitious after they began pillaging a fresh, resource-rich world and so to render them less of a threat, he made a deal with a handful of ogre leaders who jumped at his offer. The ogre clans were called together, and were told that they were to be empowered like the orcs were empowered by demon blood. But once the masses congregated, the Shadow Council and the ogre's treacherous leaders unleashed a horrific curse. 
They were attacked from within by those they were loyal to. Almost all the ogres who followed the old horde to Azeroth had their minds scrambled, damaged, filled with noise and misfires. I knew one of them who came back, Kalmura, and she was different. She was a different person, quick to anger, enjoyed killing like it was a game, and easy to confuse. Rexar sighs, turning to face the fire. We would play Narok between patrols and deployments, a game of strategy and planning ahead, deceptively simple to learn and hard to master. She'd forgotten how to play. I tried to teach her again, but it wasn't the same. I kept winning. The worst part is that she knew something was wrong. I could see she was afraid, but there was nothing to be done. We were just soldiers caught up in the lies of others. One morning our camp was hit. There were too many Alliance pouring in, and we had no choice but to retreat. Kalmora threw herself at them so we could escape. After a heavy pause, it's Verisa who offers condolences, horrified by what Gul'dan and his loyalists were willing to do to others for power, no matter the damage caused. Rexar grunts and swiftly moves the conversation along to their next step. Helping the Blood Mole rebel might weaken Ghoul's hold on the region, but the Gron will surely respond with devastating force to such defiance. Larka agrees, and Sidor goes on to point out that if they really want to make sure the Blood Mole can rebel in the first place, they need to deal with Ghoul's sons. There are seven of his cubs in all, but only five we need contend with. Two of them, Slag and Dern, fled into self-exile after they attempted to bring their father down. As we understand, the former makes his home in the barrier hills behind Shatrath, but has never threatened the city, so they leave him alone. The latter wanders the Zangar Ridge between Nagrand and Zangamash, only coming down to eat, but he never attacks the settlements. Laurelin remarks that it sounds like the two are opposed to the way their father rules. Perhaps they could be convinced to help. Rexar agrees the brothers could be convinced, but only if they show themselves capable of making progress without Slag and Dern's help, reasoning that they'll be more likely to believe it's possible to bring Gruul down if even the comparatively tiny can defy his tyranny. We travel north up Dagamore Canyon until it forks, and at the meeting point of all three branches is a coliseum ripped straight from the glory days of the Gorian Empire. Once a ruin and now repaired, shorn up, stilts and raised walkways keeping visitors and participants alike out of the murky water that fills the canyon floor. A wall rings the outer space, where a market has sprung up to cater to the bloody business of gladiatorial combat. People can make bets, indulge in drink, street food, company, they can buy armor and weapons made by some of the finest craftsfolk one can find in Outland, and as we make our way to a shaded corner, we pass through a large collection of cages and small platforms where fighters are sold like property, a slave market. Many of them are Marknathal and Saberon, but there are a handful of humans, orcs, and even the odd Arakoa or Ethereal, and of course, Bloodmall Ogres with their distinctive reddish skin. Finally, we step into a large stone house, not unlike those seen in Highmall, and are greeted by the sight of Gerontius conversing with a much smaller figure, a human wearing dark robes. Morale identifies him as Baron Sablemane, a strange recluse who lives high up on the peaks, whom she believes has some kind of agreement with the Netherwing, or they'd have certainly eaten him for trying to live in their territory by now. He's been around for as long as she can remember, and that doesn't make her any more comfortable, the man is a mystery. However, Aquila argues that this could be fortuitous, as the Baron is rumoured to be a master of alchemical arts. If they wish to take down Gruul's spawn, he must know some manner of concoction that would do the job. We approach Garontius and the Baron, whereupon Aquila explains the encounter with Gallo and our intentions regarding Gruul. 
Gerontius is relieved that Gallo was able to source help even in the mines. He almost lost hope after the boy was captured on his way to Shatrath, but if he's still alive, that means the War Mall don't suspect a thing. They may still have a chance to strike. He asks for our patience as he recalls the spies he sent to keep tabs on where Gruul's sons are, the ones who actually prowl the mountains anyway. The cruelest one, Skullock the Soul Grinder, rarely leaves his father's lair anymore, always glued to his flank like a shadowy tick. The Baron appears very interested in our plans, stating that he will help us on behalf of the Netherwing, who have been gracious allies to him. He remarks with greatly restrained anger on the draconic skeletons strewn all across the spires of Blades Edge, seething about the way Gruul and his sons hunted down every last black dragon they could find, and when there were none left, the Blade Spire began to emulate them by hunting the Netherwing. They butcher my friends like common beasts wear their skin, eat their flesh, use their claws and fangs for jewellery and grooming. The years of defilement cannot go unanswered. If they aren't stopped, it won't be just the Mokhnathal and Saberon who suffer unspeakable indignity. While we wait for the spies of Garantius to return, Sablemane brings the player with him on a gathering trip for the ingredients he'll need for a poison potent enough to bring down a Gron. Under Sablemane's supervision, we gather the rhizomes of a flower that grows in secretive parts of the Dagamore wetlands, known as Gog's Blood for its association with the ancient Ogre Rebellion and its figurehead, Gog the Gronslayer, once used as a weapon of rebel ogres fighting their Gron oppressors. How times do change, Sablemane sneers, before going on to explain to us that the juice one can squeeze and distill from these rhizomes attacks the vascular system, causing a rapid breakdown in the walls of veins and arteries. This leads to catastrophic internal hemorrhaging throughout the body. He notes that while this will significantly weaken Gruul's spawn, the Patriarch himself is too tough and hearty for such tactics. Sablemane already tried this avenue of attack, and he paid dearly for it. It will either take overwhelming force, or long years of steadily chipping away at the monster's strength until he can be easily dispatched, and they have neither the time nor the access for that. So overwhelming force it shall be. As for the delivery method, Sablemane brings us up to a large rocky plateau in the southeastern side of what used to be part of Gorgrond, and has now become the Singing Ridge. It's one of a handful of areas where the Netherwing can safely nest, covered in outcrops of massive opalescent crystals that release a constant soothing hum. The Netherwing at this point aren't outright hostile, but for now they remain unfriendly, so Sablemane does the talking as he requests a satchel of special bolts and their accompanying launcher. This prompts an excited response, showing how eager the Netherwing are as a whole to be free of the Gron, and that Sablemane has been planning for a long time. Don't look so surprised. Hate can make one particularly... focused. I wanted to cover every eventuality. A whelp returns with a crossbow and a satchel of metal bolts, which are described as hollow at the tip, but incredibly strong and light, made from the rare metal Corium. Sablemane extracts and distills the poison, filling every bolt with a hemorrhagic dose. He entrusts the adventurer with the task of poisoning Gruul's sons, admitting that he has terrible aim with these things, but that it's much safer than trying to stab them with a poison blade. He also gives us a few vials of leftover poison, in the event that we can trick the beast into ingesting it. Once we're set, he sends us back to Gerontius with the assurance that he will be watching our progress closely, and warning that it would be best not to disappoint him. There is too much hope riding on our success. One last thing, Traveller. Grolok, in particular, carries a relic of the Netherwing on his belt. I would have it when you are done. It belongs with its people. Returning to the Circle of Blood, we find that while we were gone, the spies returned with news of where Gruul's sons were, and everyone split off to keep track of them. Gerontius is pleased with our acquisition of the poison, and quickly sends us to the nearest target in the eastern region, where Moral and Aquila hunt Grolok. We find the siblings at a ledge overlooking a salt basin where Grolok tears into the flesh of a slain netherdrake. Another smaller dragon lies prone on the ground, too hurt to move and utterly terrified. Aquila makes a point of telling us that the smaller drake's wings are broken, 
The Gron prefer their meals fresh, so whenever they catch something they aren't going to immediately eat, they break it. The ogres will do it for them sometimes. Raid us, or the Snowclaws. Break the legs of those who are to be offered to Gruul or one of his sons. Sometimes they'll do it where we can see. Watch them mangle our clanmates or allies before they're dragged away. Morale bitterly adds, It's what happened to our parents. They led night raids against the ogres, became too troublesome, too dangerous. So Gruul wanted to make an example of them. He thought he could demoralize us, but all I want now is that beast's head on the spikes of Blade's Edge. With that, Morale sends us out on Nightwing to poison Grullock. At the first shot, he begins throwing rocks at us, raging and snarling, ripping up great chunks of salt from the ground. Aquila and Morale harry him from the ground and at a distance, forcing him to constantly switch his attention, and as he exerts himself, Grolok begins to bleed. First a little from his mouth, then from his nose, his ears, until finally he clutches his head and screams that his eyes are bleeding. He's struggling to see or breathe, heaving wretched, gurgling coughs as he falls to his knees, choking out words of vengeance and threat before he simply cannot hold himself up anymore and crashes to the ground. His body is described as going into brief seizures and finally goes still with a wet, frothy death rattle. Upon looting him, we acquire the relic hanging from a bag on his belt, and it's described as a large enchanted monolith of carved obsidian, a band of ensorcelled steel capping the top and bottom, with draconic imagery tooled into each face. It hums with sleeping power and warms the hand. Aquila hurries to the young drake and begins tending to its injuries, even though Morale tells him to be careful about approaching it. The drake is scared, but doesn't try to attack Aquila, allowing him to heal it just enough that it can stand. Its wings remain broken, but the young drake thanks us for killing that monster, and introduces herself as Zaraxia. The danger you put yourselves in cannot be overstated, and I am not foolish enough to assume it was merely for my benefit. You came prepared to kill one of them. Is this the beginning of something grand? Morale confirms that they intend to kill the rest of Gruul's loyal children before striking at the Patriarch himself, to which Zaraxia seems both impressed and worried. Be wary then. My sister and I were returning from a scouting mission. There is something dark lurking within Gruul's lair. It smells sharp, caustic, like demons. Appreciating the warning, Aquila informs the adventurer that he and his sister will escort Zaraxia back to the Singing Ridge, and that we should move on to the next target. We return to Sablemane and hand over the item. He thanks us and remarks that too much has been lost, so much of it impossible to recover, but perhaps the wounds of the past may yet finally become scars and nothing more. Before we can get anything less cryptic out of him, he sends us along to help Rexar. We travel southeast to the Moknathal capital of Gonregva, which would mean Spirit's Refuge in Orkish. The town sprawls across wet benchland, settled around one of the biggest oases in the arid remains of Gorgrond. Rexar lingers on a ridge overlooking the area, remarking that things have changed more than he ever could have imagined or hoped for. We'd see that the buildings below are neither fully Orcish nor Gorian, but something else, a mix of clean-cut stone bricks painted white and thick wooden beams carved and painted with all manner of beast and star imagery. There's a lot of colour here in silk banners hanging across the streets, the flat rooftops painted brilliant blues and greens, and a small corner of Gunregva is dedicated to the production of pigments for paint and dyes. All around the oasis there is farmland, small orchards, and what appears to be a meticulously managed plot of woodland used for rearing giant silkworms. Far from the desperate situation Rexar described, the Mognathal are thriving in the wreckage of this broken world, and he isn't sure how to feel. Dismissing it for now, Rexar explains that Gok is the youngest of Gruul's spawn, and eager to prove himself just as capable as his brothers. 
From what Rexar observed through his bird companion spirit, Gok appears to think attacking the Mokhnathol directly will garner him respect. An adolescent Gron is certainly less of a threat than an adult, and Gok does run the risk of dying in the attempt, but he still easily towers over any of them. The death and misery caused by an overconfident Gron. Even a youth is nothing to brush aside. We cannot let my... These people have been through enough hardship. Misha growls upon hearing a rustle in the brush, causing Rexar to spin around and demand whoever is approaching to reveal themselves. A large black warg prowls out of the undergrowth, a diamond of white in the center of its forehead. Rexar immediately recognizes it and calms Misha, calling the warg, Tethic. Harmonious spirit. Next to the warg emerges a much older Mokhnathal man, wearing well-worn leathers with a mantle made of fur and braided leather, at the end of which hang an impressive collection of fangs. Rexar addresses his father by name, sounding unsure, and Leorox remarks that his return did not go unnoticed at Thunderhold. Why have you returned? I... I wanted to see my people again. I wanted to fix what was broken between us. I didn't expect to see this. I didn't know what to expect coming back here, but this... A lot has changed since you left. So it has. You're fighting back. I thought war was beneath you, that war made us no better than the ogres. Isn't that what you told me? This is for our survival and the freedom of all who live in Blade's Edge. You left with conquerors to pillage an innocent world that we had no quarrel with. Rexar becomes frustrated, walking closer to his father. I left because our children were wandering listless in the village with bloated bellies and ribs to count. I left because our people didn't have enough to drink or eat and nothing was improving. You refused to do anything that would ease their suffering. By inflicting pain and misery on others, the way the ogres did to uphold their decadent existence, we are not those who tortured and violated to bring our people into existence, Rexar, and I will not become them for the sake of survival, Mok Nathal, Chain Breakers. That is what we are. We defend ourselves from those who would test it. At this... Rexar deflates and kneels, his head hanging. Misha nudges her head into his side, making a sad, chuffing noise. I know. I know, but it felt wrong. To do nothing after all the struggle and blood spilled to gain our freedom. We'd barely gone a generation knowing what it felt like to live without shackles. To just stand there and let us waste away without even trying. I couldn't. I couldn't do it. Rexar is described as punching the ground once with a sound of frustration. And it was all for nothing. All for lies that dirtied my hands and cut me off from you. From mother, from the clan, from home. I... I thought... I was the last one left. I wandered Azeroth's wilds with only my beasts for company for years, believing I would never touch this ground again. I didn't want glory or conquest. I just wanted our people to have that prosperous life they deserved. I was wrong. After a moment, the Orox crosses the distance and lays a hand on his son's shoulder. Your actions, yes. But I see your heart was pure, and I'm sorry I couldn't see it then. I'm sorry, my boy. I should have fought harder to keep you. Instead, I pushed you away, and right into their poisonous embrace. Rexar looks up at his father. I want to come home. 
Leorox pulls him to his feet and tells Rexar that Gunregva is open to him and his friend, to which Rexar is swiftly reminded that the adventurer has been politely standing to the side. Before we can linger here, however, a horrid roar echoes across the benchland. Prompting Rexar to quickly explain why he even came this close to Gunregva, one of Gruul's sons means to attack. Racing down to Gunregva, we arrive in time to help the town put up a fight against Gok's arrival. Rylak riders harry him from above, while Shaman and even druidic Mognathal do everything they can to limit his movements with jutting rocks and clawing brambles. It isn't until he's poisoned with the Gog's blood that the young Gron begins to slow down. Where before he easily killed defenders and broke his bonds, Gok begins the same hemorrhagic decline his brother suffered. The Orox bellows at the Rylak riders to double their efforts. The more Gok bleeds, the more frantic he gets, the harder his heart works, and the quicker he races towards death. As the smallest of his siblings, Gok exsanguinates far sooner and makes a strangled cry for his father before the last of his strength fades and his arms give out from under him. He collapses onto one of the rocky spires lifted from the ground to slow his approach, wheezing a last blood-choked breath. Even though we were victorious, Rexar expresses frustration with himself for not acting sooner. There are Magnathal dead because of it. The Orox bluntly tells him that there are always casualties when you fight a Gron, but if it weren't for him and his friend aiding them with the poison, many more would have died. They were lucky Gok was young and overconfident. Leorox turns his attention to the corpse of the fallen Gron and bitterly comments that Gok was still at an impressionable age but there was no safe way to approach or communicate, and Leorox was unwhelling to risk lives better spent elsewhere. We have ushered their kind one step closer to oblivion. I cannot and will not rest easy with that. But if they continue to attack and try to force us under their rule, we will defend ourselves. After a moment, Rexar addresses the corpse. Let your flesh return to the Earth's embrace. At this, the Oryx smiles and joins his son in a send-off rooted in the blend of shaman and druid beliefs developed by the Moknathal. Let, Let your, your bones, bones sink, sink into, into the fire, fire of its heart. Let, Let your blood nourish its waters. And Let, Let your soul join with the air. From the elements we came, and through death we give back what was borrowed, a spark, a flicker, a flame. Leorox pats Rexar on the shoulder before barking out orders to begin breaking down the body before it gets foul. The last thing they want is for it to explode from decomposition. Rexar chooses to stay with his people for now, but we know where to find him, and he points us far west to Larka and the Snowclaw Pride. Arriving in the snowy evergreen mountains of what used to be part of Frostfire Ridge, we meet up with Larka at Sun's Peak, the capital of the Snowclaw Pride. He brings us through the city, explaining what we see along the way. They've built into a thickly forested Tuya, which is a flat-topped, steep-sided volcano formed when lava erupts through a thick glacier or ice sheet, of which Frostfire Ridge used to have many. When Larka explains this to us, Sidor amends that with Outland's formation, volcanic activity is almost non-existent, so they're not at risk of another eruption. The lava tubes and icy crevices of Frostfire became their only remaining salvation when the Old Horde rose and began exterminating not just the Draenei, but anyone else who would not serve their demonic masters. After the world shattered, the surviving Saberon gathered together to find a path forward, if there even was one. On the wisdom of Witch Doctor Devorka, they climbed the broken corpse of Frostfire to find this place, and began carving out tunnels, rooms, chambers, and streets with the help of the elements. The stone of this place is supported by thick wooden beams lit by cleft hoof oil, and the black carved rock is painted in monochrome murals with a heavy focus on sun imagery, tiny spots of colour highlighting the details. Naturally, Sun's Peak is very difficult for a Gron to attack, but that is why Larka wants to speak with Devorka. The information he received from Gerontius' spy was concerning enough for him to seek a blessing. 
Devorka is an old Saberon held in high esteem by those around her, and while she is flanked by a council of other witch doctors, she holds the title of Pride Mother. Meeting with her, Larka explains that the Gron, Magok, is concocting a plague to unleash upon Sun's Peak. Gruul wants submission rather than death, but he will go for a killing blow if we're too much trouble. I know where he is, and my friend here carries poison that will significantly weaken him. We ask for a blessing, both yours and does Boru's, to ensure our blade strikes true. Sidor, you support this request? Attacking the Gron so directly is dangerous. I support it. If we are to die, then it will be in service to the Pride. Very well. We gather the materials for this blessing, mainly sacred flowers that grow in the sunniest spots around the peak, and bring them to a cave. The entrance to this cave has clearly been worked on, with reinforced struts and multiple doors protecting access to it, and inside we find what used to be the Pool of Visions. In canon, this was a sacred pool of water that the Frostwolves used for Farsia rituals. Here it still is that, but thanks to the shifting of the landmasses and the Frostwolves settling in Azeroth, there was no one around to contest the Saberon's use of it. The power still remains, and the Saberon are attuned to the use of cosmic, elemental, or nature-based magic, so it wouldn't be out of the question that they could utilize such a space. With the flowers used as incense, Laka kneels in the water and receives a blessing of divine will which is described as granting the bearer protection and clarity of focus. After Dvorka sees us off, we travel to Magok's camp in the northern lowlands, where he works on breeding verminous disease carriers within the safety of the earth. The snow melts from the peaks collects in the lowlands that bracket the western side of the Dagmal Canyon, resulting in a coniferous swamp full of fog and watching eyes. The northern tip of this swamp is dominated by a massive limestone outcrop, the constant trickle of snowmelt creating a karst that gives way to the yawning entrance of a cave. Small details in the rock give away that this particular chunk of Blade's Edge was shunted out of the Barrier Sea during Outland's formation, such as the long dead remains of coral and the fossilized shapes of aquatic invertebrates. Delving into the cave, we encounter escaped experiments and cut them down, sickened animals left to their own devices and suffering. Larka is furious at how malicious and wasteful it all is. Their world has never been more fragile, and these monsters would break it further if it got them what they wanted. We enter a large cavern to find Magok in the midst of his experiments, working with an alchemy lab and many cages filled with his chosen carriers. There's a pitfall of the things, a hungry, rabid swarm of them that scuttles and heaves. He talks to them gleefully, imagining out loud the misery of those mangy cats when he finally unleashes his virulent horde, and how pleased his father will be with the news. Perhaps he will even be pleased enough to allow me an audience. It's been so very long since we last spoke face to face. I miss him. Don't you miss your family, my little plague bombs? I'm sure you do. Larka plans our attack, and uses his magic to provide us with invisibility, tapping into a spiritual plane through his connection with Sidor. He moves away to get a good position on Magok and awaits our signal, while the adventurer moves into an ideal firing position. Without armor, hitting Magok's soft underbelly is easy, and he takes the first shot with a startled shout. Outraged, he attempts to subdue the adventurer, threatening to use us as a test subject, describing all the painful ways we'll die, as he enjoys detailing every moment. The bleeding begins just as he grabs us, sputtering a wet bark of laughter before he says, <laughs> What wicked concoction is this? It burns so delightfully. What a sadistic little creature you are. I think we'll get along so very well, you and I." At that, Larka lunges from the darkness, eyes burning blue as he plunges his sword into the back of Magok's neck. The Gron shouts and drops the adventurer, allowing us to continue harrying him while Larka wrenches his blade back and forth. He avoids Magok's grasping hands, leaving the Gron to recklessly flail between him and the adventurer until he's splattering blood everywhere. 
Magok slams into the walls of the caverns a few times in an attempt to crush Larka, but all he manages is driving the sword deeper and quickening the spread of poison through his body. The smell of blood causes the pit of vermin to chitter loudly, leading to Larka and the adventurer driving Magok towards it. Larka jumps off just in time to avoid falling into the pit with Magok, but ends up clinging to the edge, scrambling for purchase. Thankfully, the adventurer is there to help pull him the rest of the way up, leaving Magok to struggle and scream alone in the pit as the suffering animals he experimented on swarm over his bloody body and begin to devour him alive. With Magok gruesomely dealt with, Larka and Sador thank us for our aid. They insist on staying a while to burn the cavern clean of Magok's experiments and point us in the direction of Laurelin and Verisa. We find them in the northwestern split of Dagamore Canyon, hunting Gorgrom the Dragon Eater, the big brother that Grolok was trying his best to emulate. Gorgrom is lounging in a mossy glen, carved partway into the canyon wall, lazily picking at his teeth with the sharpened femur of a humanoid victim. He is surrounded by skeletal remains and wears shimmering wing membranes from Netherwing dragons, wrapped around his shoulders like a grim mantle. Unfortunately, that isn't the only dragon body part he wears. Verisa points out that the thick weave of scales and skin that protect his underbelly means they would need to get far too close for a clear shot. Seeing the likely fatal danger in this, Laurelin agrees, suggesting that they trick Gorgrom into eating the poison. To that end, Verisa has us go out to hunt some nearby basilisks, and once we bring back a pile of reptilian flesh, she realizes that while getting the meat and dosing it is simple, tricking Gorgrom will be much harder. He isn't going to just accept some random pile of meat left out in the open. This is where we learn some further details about the Dark Rangers, because Laurelin suggests possessing an ogre to bring forth Gorgrom's deadly meal. The ogres offer their Grand Master's food all the time as a sign of supplication. Gorgrom would have no reason to question it. Verisa, however, is disgusted by the suggestion. You would rip away another's free will, just like that. Laurelin is described as looking at Verisa only from the corner of her smoldering red eyes, her long ears pressed back and close to her skull in a look of guarded tension. Some hapless drudge or soldier Caught up in the machinations of their leaders? No. But a slaver. One who disregards the freedom and well-being of another living thing for their own profit or pleasure? Absolutely. And the ogres are not short of slavers. This doesn't entirely reassure Verisa, but she doesn't argue any further and concedes by saying she'll keep an eye on their target. We leave with Laurelin to find a suitably detestable ogre, and she comments that she didn't suggest this on a whim or for fun, it's just the most straightforward way she sees of accomplishing our goal. All her sisters are capable of it, they had to recover their bodies after the fall, and reuniting spirit with flesh was jarring, to say the least. Most refuse to part with it ever again, it brings up too many memories, but some can willingly do so. You will need to carry my body back to Verisa once I have settled in. I am not so skilled at this that I can dissipate my physical form, only the Dark Lady is so capable. She has always been the strongest of us, but I will certainly suffice here. Finding an especially cruel slave driver, Laurelin sheds her physical form and throws her spirit into the ogre, taking control of his body. She remarks that it isn't the first time she's possessed an ogre, but it's been a while, so we'll just have to forgive her for moving slower than we're used to. Verisa is a little bit alarmed at Laurelin's empty body, but the Dark Ranger gruffly moves along. She brings the poisoned meat to Gorgrom and offers it while we hide with Verisa nearby. Predictably, Gorgrom accepts the platter of poisoned meat, grabbing what would be a feast for a small village in one giant hand and wolfing it down in a single gulp. He condescendingly thanks Laurelin for the morsel, saying it will tide him over until he hunts himself a proper meal later on, musing that it's been a while since he's had Kleftuf, and the ones raised by those mangy cats up in the mountains are especially delicious. He starts to dismiss Laurelin, only to begin coughing mid-sentence, and the blood begins to flow. Grabbing Laurelin, he lifts the ogre body to his face, demanding to know what's wrong with the meat. 
Releasing a blasting shriek of necrotic energy directly into the Gron's singular eye, Laurelin evacuates her chosen body just as Gorgrom throws the unlucky ogre into the far wall with a wet crunch. He screams and flails, unable to see and panicking, tearing at his surroundings as the hemorrhaging spreads and worsens by the second. Laurelin sinks back into her body and snaps at us to grab her and run. She's too disoriented to move on her own. With Laurelin slung between the adventurer and Verisa, we flee from Gorgrom's fury, leaving the blinded giant to thrash, scream, and bring the walls of his own lair tumbling down on his head. Once we're a safe distance away, Verisa sets Laurelin down against a rock. Staying a while to listen would result in overhearing a conversation as Verisa checks on Laurelin like any good ranger would for another in the field. Emotes describe Laurelin flexing her hands and jaw and taking purposeful breaths in and out despite her lack of need for air. She waves away Verisa's concern, explaining that she just needs to ground herself in the physicality of her body again, stiffly remarking that she hopes she doesn't have to do that again anytime soon. It's sweet of you to care about a corpse. You're still a ranger. Do your sisters not care for you? They do. The living usually prefer us to remain inanimate. Even your new friends in the Horde? Laurelin is quiet for a moment. They were the only ones who would take us. The Dark Lady sent at least a score of envoys to your alliance, and without fail, every single one was cut down or strung up as a warning. The Horde accepted us because we are convenient, and because the Tauren believe we can be what was the word they used? Ah yes, redeemed. She spits on the ground. Redeemed. For what? For dying and not having the good grace to stay dead? For what that monster forced us to do when our minds were not our own? For a state of being we did not ask for? We are a convenient evil to most in the Horde, and a self-satisfying moral crusade for the Tauren to preen themselves over. Pitiable monsters, they can help atone for the crime of daring to exist after what that bastard prince did to us. We are not people, even to our friends. We are things tools, or a pathetic little pet project to condescend to. I thought the hatred was the worst response, but the pity. It steals whatever dignity you have left. You are a thing, not a person, and that is exactly how Menethil saw us. After a long moment, Verisa tells Laurelin that she's sorry it ever came to this. Yes, as am I. With most of the suns dealt with and the ogres still loyal to Gruul growing restless, the group is able to convince the wayward suns, Dern and Slag, to meet with them in the Zanga lowlands just on the border of Blade's Edge. Dern is much skinnier than Slag, a pallid, almost ghoulish-looking Gron, with sickly purple scarring that craters outward from his chest. His moniker amongst fearful strangers is the Hungerer, but he gruffly insists he's never eaten a person. I've snatched cleft hoof and elk here and there. That doesn't make me a baby eater. Slag is far more expected in appearance, though he too bears scars from beatings and burns. The news of their siblings' demise seems to both shock and relieve them, as they wanted things to change but hoped it could be done without killing what remains of their family. They agree, however, that our actions will make it much easier to attack Gruul, but we still have to contend with Skullock and High Dictator Mulgarius, and the brothers are far more concerned about Skullock. 
Rexar asks what makes Skullock more of a threat than an ogre lord, suspecting it's more than just physical difference. Slag nods and answers, Bulgaris may be a formidable force on the battlefield, but he is his purely martial might. Our brother is a warlock. He cavorts with demons. To this, Dern gestures at himself and adds, This is Skullock's handiwork. A parting gift when I spoke out against our father's mad quest for dominance. I wouldn't have survived if Slag hadn't carried me away on his back. Nonetheless, Dern and Slag are both willing to fight if it means an end to Gruul's tyranny. Regrouping at Gunregva, a meeting is held with Leorox, Sablemane, Dvorka, and Garontius, who agree that if the Netherwing, Mokdathal, Snowclaw, and Bloodmall all fight together to keep Gruul's ogres distracted, then Rexar's team may be able to press into Gruul's lair and cut the last remaining heads on this Hydra. Before we leave, Rexar is stopped by his father and mother, whose name we learn is Zisho. She appears to be one of the more druidic types among the Mokhnathal and a healer at that. Misha takes an immediate liking to her, and giving the bear an affectionate pet, she holds her son's face and tells him to survive and come home. They have too many years to catch up on already. Sablemane and Garontius insist on coming with us, as the Netherwing are sufficient without the Baron's guidance, and the Blood Mole will know exactly what to do when the chaos begins outside. They've been preparing for this for a very long time. We head to Gruul's Lair and enter the story mode of the raid. It begins with the sound of battle breaking out in the canyons, urging the group inward. They only have so much time before the combined forces are too drained to continue. The assault team consists of the Adventurer, Rexar, Verisa, Laurelin, Maral, Aquila, Larka, and Sidor, Dern, Slag, Sablemane, and Garontius. Fighting through the High Dictator's personal guard, we reach both Mulgaris and his Council of Governors from the other clans, including the Blood Mall's Governor Decius. The council is cut down, and in the process, Garontius personally does away with Decius, condemning him for his cowardice and greed, and setting him on fire. The fight with Mulgaris is harder, as despite his lack of magic, he has enchantments woven through his armaments that make him more than a fair fight against the group. Regardless, at the last of his strength, Mulgaris warns that Gruul will grind us all into paste between his teeth. Gruul is a living god, and gods do not die. He has ascended beyond mortal trappings to become more than we could ever understand. Gerontius approaches him, prompting Mulgaris to spit blood and vitriol, mocking the old mage over how much the Blood Mall will suffer for his actions. The Blood Mall's true leader growls a simple no, before impaling Mulgaris with an ice lance. Sablemane questions the warning Mulgaris gave about Gruul supposedly ascending to some higher power, but Garontius dismisses it as pageantry to keep the rest of the ogres in line. Gruul hasn't been seen outside his lair in some time. In all likelihood, the tyrant has grown far too comfortable on his throne. He may be an easier fight than they expected, but they should be careful regardless. Pressing on, we make our way to the deepest chamber, and an unnatural darkness seems to gather. The braziers used to light this carved out fortress become muted, diminished, until we turn a corner and the fires no longer burn a natural orange and yellow, but a sickly shade of green. Verisa comments on a terrible, acrid stench, and Laurelin agrees, adding that while Arcane has a crisp scent like cleaning chemicals, Fell magic is unmistakable for its caustic, sulfurous stink. I was going to add here that this note about magic having smells associated with it is just some personal flavor I threw in, i.e. a headcanon to use the fandom nerd terminology, but like 90% of these videos are just approachable fanfic, so there's nothing particularly special about this edition. I just think magic having sense attached is neat, and if you want me to make a little aside video explaining each one, then drop a comment saying so and I will get on that. We pass through an archway into a massive round chamber with a depressed floor and a cutscene plays. The group rushes into the room ready for a fight, and they pause suddenly as we're shown Sablemane's face shifting from aggression to utter confusion. 
The focus switches to the feet of a sickly, pale Gron, slowly shuffling across the room, moving in aimless circles, arms hanging limp from sagging shoulders, and the head lolling to one side. A ragged crown of dragon horns sits upon his head, and a singular eye is clouded over, the veins all across his body dimly glowing with a corrosive green light. He doesn't even seem to notice the group. Sablemane's dark brown eyes burn bright red like hot metal, and he bears sharp, inhuman teeth as he bellows. No, I will not be denied like this. Where is the beast who slew my fellows, the monster who devoured my children and mate? The others look at him confused, but Rexar is the one who asks what he's talking about. Roaring, Sablemane bursts into flames, his body lunging forward and expanding, wings unfurling and talons gouging into the floor, revealing himself to be a black dragon. I came to this world with my father, Naltharion. You know him better as Deathwing. And though I was under the sway of the same corruption as the rest of my kind, something changed when the planet shattered. We're shown scattered flashbacks of that moment, snapshots of chaos, panic, and Sibelian, as he calls himself, mid-flight when the orc's homeworld was rent apart. The wild, chaotic energies released by that event washed over him, and all the other black dragons who still resided there, charged with protecting a massive clutch of black dragon eggs. Sibelian remembers feeling an almighty wrench within himself, as if something was trying to tear out his entire skeleton in one horrid pull, and then he was waking up amidst the wreckage of a planet. He couldn't hear the whispers of Nazoth anymore, and neither could the others. They knew they couldn't go back, afraid of what might happen if Naltharion realized they were free, so they stayed. They stayed, and they looked after the eggs, raising not a new generation of black dragons, but a new breed created by the same chaotic release of magic that cleansed them, until Gruul and his sons began to kill them. It was our duty to protect them. They were even further removed from Naltharion's fate than we were, and they deserved every chance we could give them to forge their own path. I would not allow anything to threaten that." Sibelian's eyes narrow at Gruul's pathetic figure shambling around the room. We hid the whelps as best we could, and distracted the beasts when we couldn't. One by one, I watched my people dwindle, eaten, turned into trinkets and armor, until until I underestimated his resilience. She protected me from that mistake, and now I am the only one left. A fitting fate, isn't it? A voice calls from the far side of the room, where a massive rocky throne resides. Two bonfires catch fire, flanking the dark seat and illuminating it with fell green light. We see an ash-skinned Gron sitting on the throne, with a demonic red eye and glowing green veins much brighter than Gruul's. I must thank you for not only killing the rest of this pathetic bloodline, but for delivering what remains of it to my feet. He looks at Dern and Slag, who seem caught between regret and anger. You were fools to come back here. Dern demands to know what Skullock has done to their father, and Slag rages, asking how he can be happy about the death of their siblings. Are you not? Dern steps forward, looking at his brother with both frustration and growing sadness, and tells him that they aren't happy. It was necessary to try and fix this mess, but he tries to convince his brother to stop. He still doesn't want to kill Skullock, despite what Skullock did to him years past. He asks him if he really wants to be the last one left. Skullock 
rises off the throne, embers of fellfire dancing around his fingers. He grins wide and toothy and declares that if it means he is the ruler of Blades Edge, he doesn't care. Their people were doomed to extinction the moment their descendants realized they could be killed. He has simply accepted that as fact and acts accordingly, while others, like Dern and Slag, and even their impotent father, deluded themselves with notions of us. There is no us. There is only me. And I would have it no other way! The scene ends and Skullock commands the hollow puppet of his father to attack with him. The fight is brutal and staggering, and Skullock mocks various members of the team throughout, needling at their wounds to unbalance them. Nonetheless, once Gruul is finally killed and Skullock is brought to low health, another cutscene is triggered where Skullock brutally wounds Slag by tearing off his left arm at the elbow. But before he can deal a killing blow, Dern lunges from a swirl of darkness, raking down Skullock's back with claws of shadow. Skullock batters Dern away, but in the moment it takes him to do that, Sabellian strikes. The Black Dragon clamps his jaws around Skullock's throat and crushes it, pushing the Gron to the floor before he gives an almighty heave and rips it out. Cutscene over, we see Dern carrying Slag over to the group, where Sibelian helps the injured Gron by cauterizing his wound with fire. The pair intend to find somewhere quiet to rest, recuperate, and discuss what to do next now that they are the only ones left, but they have no interest in rulership. They just want to live in peace, whatever form that takes. Larka sincerely asks Sibelian how he's feeling, and the dragon responds that he will always miss his mate, mourn his children, but he has the Netherwing now, and he will do everything in his power to keep them away from his father's corruption. Sidor asks what his mate's name was and Sibelian answers with a sad but warm tone that her name was Noxira. Morale sourly comments on Sablemane deceiving them, but Sibelian dryly asks her if she wouldn't have just tried to spear him if he approached her in his true form. And do not insult my intelligence by saying you would have waited for me to speak. Morale concedes his point, and Sibelian shrinks, returning to his human guise. I did not ask for Notharian's fall. I did not ask for an old god to whisper paranoia and fear into my father's mind and stretch its foul influence across my entire flight, polluting us one after another, turning a proud and protective people into symbols of misery and evil for all. He goes on to say that everyone present is accustomed to the demands of survival. Dern and Slag, the last of their kind, struggling against the twisted machinations of their family. Rexar, Morale, and Aquila, Mokhnathal, forcibly bred shock troops scrabbling for purpose in a world they were made to destroy. Larka, a Saberon, bound to the soul of the mate he couldn't bear to lose, warrior of a people who settled in one of the harshest environments left in this world for the sake of safety. Garantius, an ogre trying to reclaim a measure of dignity and respect from the shattered remains of his fallen culture. And finally, Verissa and Laurelin. Oh, he's had much through his spies amongst Kael'thas's lot, the lost daughters of a broken nation, splintered and haunted by the loss of their most cherished flame, struggling to find where they belong. They jump at the implication he might have information they need, but he agrees to tell them after the group has gotten somewhere safer. Thanks to a portal opened by Garantius, we return to Gunregva and the coordinated attacks are called off. According to Leorox, there were fewer casualties than expected. The ogres weren't so confident knowing that a small team was able to bring down the sons of their supposed god king and lost the will to fight entirely when news of the attack on Gruul's lair spread like wildfire after a hot summer. Laurelin and Verissa immediately talk to Sibelian about what he knows, asking how long he's been paying attention to the comings and goings of Outland. Long enough to know that one Elaria Windrunner travelled to a location once known as Farallon. Today we call it Netherstorm. You will find your wayward prince there. As for the Lady Windrunner, I cannot say what became of her, but there have been no sightings of her since the planet shattered. 
Marisa thanks him for that information, though she admits she never thought she'd be thanking a black dragon for anything. She remembers far too well what unspeakable horrors Deathwing's machinations brought upon the Lifebinder. Yes, I know of what you speak, and believe me that if the time comes for my father to face a reckoning, I will be there. Barisa appreciates the sentiment and apologizes for the unfair remark. She can see Sibelian is what the Black Dragon Flight was meant to be. He's described as smiling sadly and wishes them luck in finding the answers they seek. With Blade's Edge free from Gron control, a number of side quest chains would open up. Meeting with Sibelian once more, we'd help him secure the Netherwing's home in the peaks and cliffs of Blade's Edge, touching on their Black Dragonflight heritage, how they feel about it, and their will to forge their own path away from that legacy. The Netherwing sees Sibelian as their patriarch and a figure of guidance, but he clearly leaves the actual leadership of the flight to the eldest of their clutch. We'd see a few sweet moments of young Netherwing following him around like lost puppies, and even the hatching of eggs where he helps welcome these new whelps into the world. Another quest chain would involve spending more time with Rexar and the Mocknathal, gaining more insight into his relationship with his parents, and seeing him reconnect with his culture. We'd get to see more Mocknathal lore, which is criminally lacking from what I could find, and it would just be a chill questline for the most part. We already had a lot of stress and fighting in the main story. We would see Morale and Aquila in a more relaxed context as well, showing young Mocknathal how to hunt or commune with the elements if they show promise for it. A third side quest would offer more time with the Snowclaw Saberon and Larka, helping him and Sidor investigate a recent incursion by Ethereals from the Consortium. They'd be looking to exploit the resources of a dig site carefully unearthed by Saberon sages, where they uncovered an ancient shaman stone that the Frostwolves once used to gain blessings. This chain would give us insight into the principles carried by the Saberon, as they clearly held a respect for the site, even though it was most important to orcs. The Frostwolves were amongst those who did not partake in the demon blood, and if it wasn't for one of their members guiding fleeing Saberon to the lava tubes beneath Frostfire, the Snowclaw would simply not exist. And with that, we are holy sh how long was this? Why did I do this to myself? And with that, we are finally done with Blade's Edge, and I sure hope you enjoyed it because it really ran away from me, which is odd because I find this zone one of the most forgettable ones. Then again, that leaves a lot of open space to work with, and I cannot be trusted with open space because, as you can see, it gets out of hand. Anyway. I have more or less settled into my new place, and now that I've gotten this out of the way, I should be able to get back to a comfortable swing again. I love making these videos, but you know what gets me absolutely jazzed about creating things? When it inspires other people to also make things in response. I got some fan art from the Nagran video. Look! Some lovely goddamn nerd went and drew Shiragla. Look at it! That's amazing! And another lovely nerd put together what they imagined Lantressa would look like in-game based on my description, plus what it might look like if the Throne of Elements was actually made from Gron's mountainous skull. That's fucking neat! Thank you so much. This kind of stuff puts a very big smile on my face. Special shoutouts to my supporters on Patreon, who are all very handsome people, and especially to my newest patrons, Ryan Van Schack, Callum Dor, and Kasserkin. Thank you all for watching, please take care of yourselves, and I will see you next time as we journey into the mana-racked ruins of Netherstorm.